Hi, thank you very much. I'm Bernard Hahn from DKIX and um, yeah, today's talk is uh, to provide you some insights about the recent integration of eVPN and the activation of um, proxy agent functionality on our platform. Um, while I won't recap in general on eVPN functionality, I will yeah, provide some, some details about the challenges that we see as an IXP network as well as details about the migration that we did and finally talk about the results, uh, what shifted, what happened in our network after we activated those functionalities. So, talking about why it was so necessary to do this. Um, while, we, while we're eager to celebrate another new peak each and every week out there, the, the downside of, of having a lot of, a lot of peers in our larger IXP networks like New York Madrid or of course Frankfurt is, that we see an increasing amount of broadcast on unicast and multicast traffic in our network. And the truth is that every packet of this noise is knocking on the interfaces of your routers and uh, wants to be evaluated and by that causes some serious CPU load. And uh, we have seen already in the past that for smaller boxes it was impossible to work properly being connected to our Frankfurt network and this simply simply is not acceptable, we need to do something about that. Because the situation might get even worse in the future as we might connect even more and more participants to our network. A second major uh, motivation for us to, to, to do something about that was uh, the, the constant threat of proxy up or proxy never discovery. So if due to misconfiguration, a participant of the IXP network decides to, uh, to, to answer to uh, address resolution requests that are not uh, yeah, for him, uh, there is nothing that you can really do than uh, take, in, take in the phone, reach out to the customer and request him to immediately change his configuration and if this doesn't work then uh, yeah, to shut or disconnect customer finally from the, um, from the fabric in order to make sure that you save all of the other customers. So uh, eVPN with a proxy agent functionality was a very good way to find a solution to that but we'll get into the details on how that works later on. Um, what I also want to show you today is um, some, some issues that we saw on the platform when it comes to certain traffic patterns or flow patterns. And um, for that, it's important to understand how port security works at DKIX. And what you can see here is that uh, on, the, on the ingress side of all of our customer interfaces, we do a classification of the traffic into broadcast, unknown, unicast, and multicast traffic and rate limit all of those to one megabits per second each. And on top of that, then uh, the, the regular unicast, unicast traffic is applied. Um, if you take a look at the egress side of the network, then um, we do a general BUM uh, rate limiting to 5 megabits per second and then on top of that the regular uh, customer traffic is applied. Um, so it, it's important to keep in mind that even if a customer fully makes use of all of his ingress use, he can't produce an overload egress wise because yeah, there is still some headroom of 2 megabits, um, so address resolution or uh, other mechanisms um, should still work. On top of that, yes, we of course do static MAC entries and we have egress and um, ingress MAC filters on all of our ports. So the first problem that, that I want to dig deeper into is the problem of long-lasting flows, which is not specifically to IXPs or VPLS-based networks like we have. Um, this can also uh, happen to any switch-based network uh, where you have multiple nodes on the way. So um, let's assume we have a customer sending a traffic flow to another customer um, over, over the infrastructure and he does this for a very long time. And uh, what can happen is that on an intermediate node, the MAC just ages out and gets dropped of the, of the FIP or FDB or however you call that. And um, by that, the traffic then gets classified as unknown unicast, which would mean in the DKIX infrastructure that it gets rate limited to 5 megabits per second ingressly and just flooded locally. So effectively, the communication is interrupted. So what you're going to do about this? Easy answer. You start to increase your MAC aging timers. But if you do this, 
you run into another problem of long-lasting max uh, that I want to show here. Um, so let's see when we have uh, multiple customers sending traffic flows to another customer that is uh, connected in, in another part of the network, another VPLS instance or another router, for example. And um, immediately this customer gets disconnected. Then what happens is that the MAC of this customer gets withdrawn from the local uh, FIP but this information is not shared with the other uh, VPLS instances or routers within the network in classic flood and learn. So what happens is that the incoming traffic gets then classified as being unknown unicast. It gets flooded locally. It gets egress wise rate limited, but not really because our egress MAC filters make sure that the customers only get the traffic that is destined to their, um, to their MAC addresses. But the important point to see here is that uh, if this is a very large customer, so let's assume the incoming traffic flows could be multiple of hundreds of gigabits that come in and that now get immediately recognized as being unknown unicast. And by that, they put a very large pressure on the internals of your gear, uh, on the chipsets and the switch fabric and everything that is involved on the path. And we have seen issues with that already um, in the past. Um, and we needed to, to yeah, come up with some mitigation strategies in here that worked so far. But if we take a look on how this changes, if we, if we introduce eVPN in our infrastructure, then we see that the unknown unicast classification pattern just inverses because now the information is shared with all of the other parts of the network that this MAC has been withdrawn. The customer is disconnected and uh, all of the local nodes or the sourcing nodes um, already start to classify the traffic as being unknown unicast. If this really impacts how much unique, unknown unicast we see in our infrastructure, we will see later on when we take a deeper look into the traffic patterns uh, and uh, yeah, what finally changed after the migration. Another, um, another type of incident that I want to share with you today is the, uh, the, um, the scenario of VLAN loops. And it, it might sound synthetical, but we have seen this in the last year. That's why I uh, also pasted um, a screenshot of an announcement that we did last year here. Um, so let's see how that one works. Let's assume we have a customer that is connected with two routers to the IXP infrastructure with two dedicated connections, like yeah, a lot of customers do due to redundancy. Um, now let's see what happens if this customer, for whatever reason, decides to put a switch on his side and by that shortcuts the two interfaces that he has to the IXP fabric. Um, there are very, uh, several steps now happening. Um, the first thing is that uh, the two routers continuously inject bomb traffic into the IXP network, which of course they do. They still send ARP requests or neighbor discovery requests. And what then happens is that this bomb traffic starts to circulate between the IXP network and the customer's network if the customer does not any does not apply any, any additional security mechanisms on the, on the switching equipment on his side. And this is a very slow process because the amount of uh, broadcast and multicast traffic just increases slowly as he injects another request, another request, and this starts to loop and um, finally we hit the, the magic egress rate limit that we were talking about because we already have a lot of noise in our network and then the additional uh, traffic from these two connections kicks in to avoid a proper address resolution in the network. So yes, having, having the ability to simply stop broadcasting um, the uh, broadcast traffic and uh, the multicast traffic is a good way yeah, to mitigate, mitigate this kind of scenario. Um, so let's dig into how this ARP and neighbor discovery agent functionality works that we have just implemented. It's on top of the basic eVPN um, functionality and um, 
while I think the, the, uh, how a proxy agent works in general is, is quite clear, yeah, it starts to reply um, on the behalf of other customers um, to uh, send out answers to address resolution requests. But uh, on top of this, we implemented some functionality that is stated in RFC 9161, which gives us the possibility to configure static IP to MAC bindings on our nodes, and by that to control the behavior, to not have any sort of uh, dynamic learning, but just to have static entries in the router's database to make sure we can control what the router um, is answering to all of the customers. This RFC also states a lot of other functionality that is relevant to IXPs, like uh, for example having two Macs being mapped to a single IP, which we might introduce hopefully throughout the next year in order to support yeah, your demands when it comes to the exchange of routers equipment and you want to have two Macs um, that are being able to be resolved to a single IP or even yeah, duplicate address detection scenarios when a customer configures an, IX, uh, an IP that is not belonging to him to have the ability to mitigate in scenarios like that. Um, now, let's talk about the migration that we just did and, and how this worked out for us. Um, while we were planning the overall migration procedure for, for our global network, we were considering three major goals that we wanted to achieve by defining the, um, the procedure. <clears throat> the first goal was we just wanted to do small steps. We wanted to reduce the risk of having a too, uh, too large change at once and by that, yeah, just um, seeing our infrastructure burn because something goes wrong. We wanted to reduce complexity, we wanted to avoid scenarios like where we needed to make non-EVPN based configurations work with EVPN based configurations and we wanted to avoid that our uh, operations teams would have a hard time throughout the, um, throughout the migration period because of an increasing complexity of how our network works. And, um, the third goal was we wanted to clearly reduce downtimes to make sure that our customers do not suffer too much from the migration that we do and uh, yet to, to do this in, an, in the most easy way as well for you as well for us. So we, we, we took a look at different scenarios, for example, if we, if we would have gone with router by router migration. You know, this, of course, yeah, would have counted into the, uh, to the goal of having small steps, quite small steps, but it would have increased complexity in a ridiculous way, as well as bringing in a lot of downtimes. Um, we finally decided to go service by service. As I already mentioned, our MPLS-based networks is providing VPLS services, and um, we decided to go with the migration of whole VPLS environments. So if we talk about the uh, migration of Frankfurt, as we do provide remote peering, um, the peering services are not only available in Frankfurt, they're also available in Hamburg or in Munich or in Düsseldorf. So that means that we um, change the configuration on a whole bun bunch of routers on a whole part of our network. This clearly reduces downtime because this basically means that you only get one maintenance announcement for the switch over or the activation of the new functionalities in our network. But it doesn't really count in to, uh, to the small steps um, that we wanted to do because in fact it's, it's larger steps. So we really, really needed to make sure that whatever we do there just needed to work. It, it wasn't feasible to uh, to fail on, on, on that migration. Um, so we put a very, very uh, huge amount of our efforts um, to prepare this migration and to do, to do a proper testing. And of course, we also had the challenge of identifying a representative part of our network that we put into a testing environment, yeah, because just rebuilding the global network, is, is there is no business case behind that. And um, 
we, uh, for that, created a virtual lab environment in the Azure cloud, some Ansible uh, playbooks behind that in order to spawn and withdraw and do a certain set of, of tests that we run through. Um, once we changed the configuration or something changed in the procedure that we planned to do this. And while there are very good solutions now on the way, like, like Container Lab or Key and E that you might have already heard about, we already started the work while, while these uh, solutions were already out there. And uh, yeah, had to do all of this on our own. But I think every hour invested here was worth it. Yeah, because once you have done this, this ramp up work, then it helps you a lot in order to make sure you can do integration tests in the future too. As eVPN and this uh, proxy agent stuff was a um, mainly control plane feature, we had a very good test coverage, but of course we were not able to test everything or see everything. Like for example, the large traffic patterns that we see in our network out there or the behavior of uh, yeah, the uh, diverse customer equipment that are connected to our infrastructure and to test all of that but we will, we will see what, what happened later on. Also um, important um, to mention is that we um, invested huge efforts in the configuration tool chain, which is behind that. Because um, before we did the, the migration, a lot of our configurations were still done manually to some extent. But we decided, no, we, we, we can't do this anymore. Yeah, we need to template all of our configurations. We need to define a source of truth. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, the configuration is in a defined state overall globally. And that meant we had to do a lot of clean up works. Um, and what you can see here is a landscape of the systems that are involved um, in the configuration creation at DKIX and all of these systems needed to be uh, synchronized and needed to be able to support the migration procedure. And this also yeah, took a lot of, of the efforts um, to get there and to, to really make sure that every line of code um, was created in the way that we, that we expected it. So, and after, after everything was prepared, you just need to turn over the switch and uh, turn on the functionality. And uh, what, you, what you can see here basically is, uh, is a graph from the uh, traffic levels that uh, we measure on a dedicated port on our Frankfurt infrastructure. And what you can see here is that we needed to um, unconfigure this port before the migration began and, and needed to reconfigure it um, after the migration was done. That's why, why there is a gap. But what we, what we clearly can see is that the amount of bump traffic already decreased and um, what we also, uh, what, what happened is um, at the exact point of the migration is um, before the migration we copied all of the configurations that we wanted to apply to the routers locally on the routers. Of course you do some syntax checks and then you check if everything is, is fine with the configurations that you want to apply. And then with cluster shell or whatever you like, we committed the configuration all at once to immediately um, apply the new configurations and just expect the downtime of the uh, convergence of the eVPN to happen. It sounds strange, but we, we try to avoid um, issues due to remote connectivity to the routers, broken pipes, broken SSH sessions or things like that. So we just copied everything beforehand, which for the largest router at Frankfurt meant configuration change of uh, 11,000 lines of code and then immediately applied it. And yeah, it, it took roughly six seconds to get this configuration applied and while we were checking ourselves if the network is still in a healthy state, it looks like we did, didn't even, even lose um, a single ping while the reconfiguration took place and uh, the eVPN uh, kicked in and converged. That was a pretty nice experience um, because it, it simply worked and all of the efforts that we, that we put into the uh, migration preparation uh, yeah, were worth it um, because uh, yeah, it was a quite smooth migration and it just worked as expected. 
But let me later show you what didn't work as expected because every time there is something that didn't work as expected. So talking about the results, what did we see changing after we introduced eBPN and uh, we activated the, uh, the proxy agent functionality? So what we can see here is the, uh, the change in the packets per second um, that we measured in our Frankfurt platform. So um, we see a very, very huge decrease in IPv4 and IPv6 bump traffic um, that happened after the activation. And um, also the decrease rates per frame type involved heavily decreased. There was just a few multicasts before the migration on the platform and there was even less after the migration. But um, on the unicast, multicast as well for IPv4 and for IPv6, um, everything decreased. So the new functionality really kicked in on all of these of the frame types involved. Um, if we take a look at the, the distribution of IPv4 and IPv6, um, of the overall bump traffic, um, we can see that there is a larger amount of IPv4 before the migration than after the migration. So the features that we enabled are better in mitigating um, the, um, the bump flooding um, for, for IPv4 than IPv6. And if we take a look at the distribution of broadcast, anon, unicast and multicast in IPv4 before the migration and after the migration, then we can see that after the migration, the amount of anon unicast even dropped. Of course, because of that, broadcast got a little bit higher. I think overall, the total amount of packets yeah, just went down, what we have seen um, on the slides before that, but um, within the bump distribution, we can see that the amount of unknown unicast also dropped. And if we take a look at the IPv6 traffic pattern, uh, we can see, yeah, IPv6 mainly was multicast driven before the migration and still is after the migration. So uh, the traffic distribution here almost stays the same. So, what didn't work? What, what went wrong on our way? Um, while enabling um, EVPN, we, we moved over from TLDP-based tunnels to autobound tunnels uh, via EVPN, and by that, we lost the possibility of having hash labels um, in our MPLS for traffic distribution on our LACs and we needed to um, enable entropy labels, additional entropy labels in our label stack to make sure that the traffic gets spread equally um, over the lags that we have in Frankfurt. And uh, the usage of these entropy labels did not work on any box involved in our network. That's why we <coughs> experienced um, some, some yeah, high load on, on some of the links in our Frankfurt network while some interconnects were just very yeah, low loaded and um, we finally found out that uh, the reason for this has, has to do with the entropy labels and that are not being interpreted uh, correctly on some of the boxes that we have. We have a case with our render open to that. Um, is there something that we can do about this? Yes, um, nicely yes. Um, we were able to add um, another type of hashing mechanism um, on the legs that are affected to make sure that uh, the boxes start to equally load, sh load uh, share the load um, on each of those legs members um, so that we have a fix or a workaround at least until we have an answer to that problem. Another thing that we um, experienced, unfortunately, was that our IPv6 neighbor discovery agent is uh, replying to requests with the wrong source IP or even with an old um, source IP address, which under, under certain circumstances uh, with certain router models and certain software release leads to a non-functioning address resolution for a few of our customers. So after, after we got some of the complaints, we decided to shut down the feature. So the IPv6 neighbor discovery agent is currently not active anymore and uh, we will have to do a software upgrade to get that one fixed and um, yeah, to, um, to have this functionality back in our, um, in our network again. 
Okay, so that's basically all of it. Feedback. Thank you, Bernard. We have time for some questions. So are there any questions? Run, audio angel, run. Hi. Uh, there's two questions for me. One is uh, which platform you use for automation, because you said in six seconds, applied everything. And the second question is for the last part, because you said that uh, IPv6 neighbor discovery is not working, and um, the solution was software upgradation, upgrade, and um, you, you have done all your migration in about 25 minutes. It's in the same time or <laughs> later? <laughs> no, um, fortunately not. Um, so the question about the automation, we do have some internal self-developed tools in order to create configurations out of uh, systems like Netbox um, that you might have seen on the slides. The way that we applied those configurations was that we just copied the new configuration as a file locally to the devices and then um, committed those, um, those configurations in order to make sure that the full configuration is applied and no yeah, effects kick in while we apply the configurations remotely. So there is no true automation solution on how we apply configurations um, onto our network devices for that migration. The second question um, about the required software updates that we need to do is, yeah, we need to do classic firmware upgrades on our routers, which is a multi-hour procedure per box um, overall, and as we need to do this globally, um, it will take us some time. So it wasn't applied in the same 25 minutes, this means, means you did this stuff later in we still need to do this software upgrade. <laughs> okay, the internet has questions. Um, what could be or what are the reasons for the unknown unicast traffic? Well, um, unknown unicast happens if uh, traffic gets locally flooded because there is no known MAC to IP binding. Um, available. So whenever, I just showed the example in uh, throughout the slides, whenever um, a participant of the peering network disconnects, for example, and the, um, the uh, MAC to IP binding gets withdrawn from the local um, FIP tables, then immediately all of the traffic that is still injected in the platform and destined to this customer's MAC address gets uh, recognized as unknown unicast and locally flooded on all of the nodes. That's the major reason for unknown unicast. Okay, and the second one, by checking so many packets, uh, so many times a packet, what SLA uh, to deliver a packet do you guarantee over your infrastructure? One millisecond should be an upper limit? Um, well, I, I'm pretty sure that there are some SLA documents out there that we have uh, to, to make sure uh, we, which times we agree to our customers in order to uh, push packets through our network. And um, we did not expect that uh, the overall forwarding procedure um, takes pretty much longer as um, so far we haven't seen any increase in latency times on our internal measurement tools due to the activation of that feature. In fact, we were also monitoring the CPU load of our internal boxes because we didn't know, hey, activating a new feature um, in such an environment, uh, what will be uh, the, um, the impact on the local CPU load? And we, we didn't see uh, a large, a really large increase, maybe one to five more percent of, of CPU load when it peaks. Um, but um, so far we did not experience any higher latency to pass packets through the network. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Then, thank you very much. A warm applause for Bernard.